Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to class. Today we are going to talk about language and gender. Gender is uh, gender has become a point of uh, you know discussion and uh, a, a ven uh, an avenue for research after the 1960s in the in the early 60s and 70s. the issue of gender has emerged in social sciences and various disciplines with multidisciplinary approach uh scholars are you know uh, engaged in understanding the social concept called social category called gender and the and the field of linguistics specifically emergence of social linguistics post 1960s had seen a a a huge interest and a very wide study wider wider spectrum of uh, you know study and research and publications since 1970s we 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 get a specific mention and a very uh, categorical discussion of women's language in Otto Jespersen's work of 1922 a chapter dedicated to it um, the woman a chapter dedicated in this book and uh, since then there was a almost like you know no challenge to that idea jespersen put forward but in 1975 a monumental work appeared by robin lekoff and that changed so today we will we'll take a very brief note on this relationship between language and gender as we know we are all born with a particular sex right as a girl as a boy so sex is biological right it's an outcome of re reproduction system so we are born as a boy we are born as a girl but the term gender is socially constructed so sex is biological and gender is social it is socially constructed so a set of roles expected by a particular sex to perform refers to gender so gender is the social role that we perform as a sex as a particular sex whether a man or a woman right so this is a very uh, interesting and uh, significant development that took place in late 60s and early 70s where gender became the object of study and that to focus study in applied linguistics and social linguistics now the gender differences now the gender differences in language can be understood at two different levels number 1 how language encodes gender or the form and the structures available in a language that represents gender that attends to gender right so the presence of gender centric expressions words and structures so at the formal level we can understand gender in language like you know uh, in hindi we have all the nouns with a particular gender so car is feminine truck is masculine so that is you know assigned gender to it 
grammatical gender. Hindi has grammatical gender. For example, Ram, Aam khata hai, Sita, Roti khati hai. Khata hai, uh, masculine marker, khati hai, feminine marker. And verb agrees with the gender of the subject. So, khana is verb agrees with gender of the subject. Ram Aam khata hai. And uh, again, Sita Roti khati hai. So, khati hai has E ending verb marker that denotes feminine gender, right, of the subject. So, Hindi has grammatical gender, right? And uh, even the non animates in Hindi have genders. Pen, must feminine, right? So, but one is one, there is something called biological sex, and this is grammatically assigned in such cases. Mary car, my car, right? So, long e ending that denotes feminine gender in Hindi, and that is broadly, there are certain ex except, uh, exceptions, but broadly, this is the feminine marker. So, you can understand the relationship between gender and language in terms of the forms, the structures, and this is reflected in, uh, you know, vocabulary very prominently. But Hindi has grammatical gender as well. Verb has to agree with the, with the gender of the subject. Then the other perspective with which we can look at gender is the, is the gender roles performed and how language is used, how utterances are used, right? So, how language is used by different gender roles, the difference between genders while using language in terms of a style, choice, in discourse. So, how woman speaks and how a man speaks. So, one is the form. The, the one perspective is looking at the form and the, and the structure a present in language and how language rep, you know, represents the bias towards gender. The second one is how language is used by different genders. So, youth centric, user centric and youth centric, right. So, the idea that women's speech is deficient and limited was first brought into discussion by Otto Jesperson in his work, The Woman, a chapter in his 1922 book called Language, Its Nature and Development and Origin, published in 1922, right? And this, this idea that woman's language is deficient, restricted, right, reflects the social structure of the time. And we all know that post 60s, 70s, we see a rise in, uh, you know, demands and struggle for women empowerment. And it has changed lots of expressions in language as well. It has been reflected and represented in the language as well. Right? So, chairman is no more a chairman. Now we call chairperson. A sportsman is no more a sportsman. We call it a sports person. Uh, and and there is a there is a accusation, and to a great extent, it is absolutely right that languages, right, are male biased, biased towards men, bad towards male. So there is an argument that we see the world through the lenses of men. Right, uh, you don't have to go too far. You know, look at look at a word like Mister. Mister is an honorific marker, which we prefix with any name to honor a person, to show respect to a person. The feminine equivalent of Mister is Mistress, but can we use Mistress in any, uh, you know? public place, 
to represent a woman? What goes in? Why master is honorific, respectful, and why, why not mistress? So mistress means something else, right? It represents an ex extramarital affair, and a woman is seen as, as you know, uh, she she is she is looked down upon. So we don't use mistress. If you look at the abusive terms in any language. Which is so the terms directed towards men, the so number of such expressions will be counted. Very, very small. But when you look at the curse words and abuses directed towards women, all languages have plenty of them. Language bias. This is bias we are talking about. Right? Somehow, if you look at the expressions, right, like my lord, honorific marker, my lord, a respectful mode of addressing the justice, uh, the judge, or uh, any noble person. But can we say my lady? So the Feminine equivalent of Lord is Lady. So I can say my Lord, but can I say my Lady? So these biases, because, because when we see these expressions in the language, they are not at equal level. These expressions are somehow biased towards men. Look at examples like, you know, when we refer to uh, something which, uh, whose gender is not known. So, by default, we represent he. Right? By, represent, by default, we mention he. Right? Not she. But of late, recently, it's a recent development where we have been using the terms like his and her, he and she. So, we are, you know, juxtaposing she with he, her with him. But it is a recent development. So, because of ideological shift and uh, you know struggle for women empowerment, things are changing in language as well. Expressions are changing. But that is true. That just person mentioned the woman's language as deficient, and this idea was not challenged until 1975, when a monumental work by Robin Lakoff emerged, right? And that changed the discourse on gender and language. So, there are three main approaches to understand the relationship between language and gender that we, that we, that we practice in social linguistics and applied linguistics, which emerged from 1970 onwards. And these are deficit approach. Number two, dominance approach, and number three, difference approach. So we have three approaches to understand language and gender. Deficit approach, as the name suggests, women's language is seen as a def as deficient. Dominance approach, that that represents and reflects male dominance, and the consequent deficient speech by women. And the third is a very uh, democratic, flexible approach where women and men are seen as two categories which socialize in two different subcultures. So, different approach, right? So, uh, when you, if you want to to go deeper into this idea, you can look at two important publications which are considered central text in understanding relationship between language and gender. And these two are number one, uh, an edited book by Kira Hall and Mary Bolshoz, published in 1995, Gender Articulated, Language and 
Language and the Socially Constructed Self by Rutledge, New York. Another text which is central in understanding the relationship between language and gender is an edited volume by Janet Holmes and Miriam Meerhoff, 2003, The Handbook of Language and Gender, right? Blackwell publication. Massachusetts. Apart from these two texts, we have many other wonderful books and publications, and you can have a deeper look into this theme. And uh, the the major works and the prominent researchers who have worked in this field of language and gender. In they include, uh, you know, Deborah Tannen, Penelope Eckhart, Janet Holmes, Mary Bushalls, Kira Hall, Deborah Cameron, Janet Sunderland, and many. And of course, this discourse was triggered by Robin Lickoff. So we will go. So we will go to each of these approaches to understand language and gender relationship between language and gender, one after the other. So let us begin with deficit approach. And as I told you that uh, women's language is deficient, restricted, right, and subordinate to the language of men, this idea was propagated and, you know, discussed by Otto Jesperson in his 1922 book. And this idea was not challenged until the publication of Robin Lecoff's work in 1975. And Robin Lecoff's work, 1975, you know, in a way endorses this idea, in a way comes closer to this idea. But she was the one who eloquently and, uh, uh, you know, very elaborately discussed this idea, deficit approach. So it describes male language as a stronger, more prestigious, and more desirable. And she argues that women are socialized into behaving like ladies. You might have heard expressions in your own mother tongue, like ladies, like girls. So any act, even a, a boy perform, starts crying in public for small reasons. You might have heard people using the terms like, you know, don't cry like a girl. So the act of crying is attributed to girl. It's ladies-like, it's woman-like. So, you know, the gender biases in social structure are represented and reflected in our expressions and language biases as well. And Lekhoff says that men's language is stronger more prestigious and desirable. Uh, this approach describes the way women's speech style includes features like tag questions. And we know what, what is the function of tag questions? Confirmation, seeking confirmation. Right? So she mentions these features like you know tag questions, rising intonation and hedges. So when you're not very clear. Uh, we try to cover it up and with the help of hedges. So hedging in language is not, it's a non-specific element. A specificity is missing. So hedging is another feature she comes up with, which are expressive of uncertainty, lack of confidence and excessive difference or politeness. Right? This approach looks at women's speech as generally inferior to that of men's, and reflect their sense of personal and social inferiority. So what you see? The gap, the discrimination of gender in our social practices. The gap of gender in society is reflected in language as well. This approach looks at language from that perspective where men's language is seen as stronger, in Lekhoff's terms, stronger, 
prestigious and desirable. It becomes a benchmark, right? Whereas the woman's language is seen as deficient, which lacks, you know, specificity, which lacks, you know, uh, strength, and which has features like tag questions, hedging. So tag questions or hedging, that means they're not certain about it. And that is the reason why another another uh, you know perspective comes in here, the power. So does the power ascribed to a particular gender also plays role in def deficiency in women's speech? Because women, by and large, are not empowered. There is a lack of equality. So that, that, you know, does that inequality or uh, you know uh, the gap or discrimination ascribed to women play a role in determining expressions, tone, tenor, and style? So this is what deficit approach is all about. It looks at women's language as deficient. Then we have dominance approach. With, so the idea of dominance approach is rooted in the social discrimination and gap which is practiced in a particular culture between genders. So societies are male dominated. The men control resources. The men share the bigger pie of power. Right? Women are not empowered. So this gap or this dominance of men in the social space, cultural space also re is reflected in the language. So man has acquired superordinate status and woman as subordinate status. So male as a gender is superordinate and female as a gender is subordinate. This is an unfortunate uh, you know, situation. And this dominance approach underlines the same thing. So this approach looks at women as subordinate group, whose difference in style of speech results from male supremacy and from an effect of patriarchy. This explains how language is primarily male-centered. If you look at, let's say, you know, uh, referential expressions like gender when we refer to gender in sentences and when the gender is not clear it is by default he right man is a social animal what about the woman they are antisocial or they are not social but man includes women the term man includes women in this in this saying in this quote right so, a God-fearing man, it includes women as well, but by default it is male, right? Because societies and cultures are male-dominated. The men enjoy power, dominance, and they have control on resources. Talbot criticizes this approach as manifestation of patriarchal social order. This approach can be cited along with difference approach and both of them provide an early model for analysis of language and gender in social sciences. So gender gap in society is also reflected in language, in expressions, in the style, in the register. Right? So this is dominance approach. Then the third approach is difference approach. Difference approach is an approach of equality. So in this approach we look at these two genders as equal. So this is an approach of equality differentiating men and women as belonging to different subcultures as they have been socialized to do so since childhood. So this approach, this you know, you know, treats 
these two genders equal and attributes the differences in socialization as a consequent result. How this socialization takes place when we are born? You can see around you, in your households, in your own family. Okay, let me give you a perspective. Suppose you are going to get a gift for a small baby, right, on his or her birthday. So you go to the shop, gift shop, and ask for a gift. And this is typical of all Indian shops wherever you go, irrespective of the states and provinces and you know societies. You go and say, I want a gift for a baby. The first question shopkeeper asks, is it a boy or a girl? For whom do you want a gift? Now it is so significant at such an early age to mention the kind of gift you are going to get for the baby. So when you say it's boy, he will show you, he will offer you truck, transformers, those male characters, chauvinist, uh, you know, strong characters from the cartoons, guns. When you say it's baby, girl, they will show you soft toys, kitchen set, dolls, right? So somehow, we are conditioned this way. The way we are raised in a family, if you have your siblings, sister and brothers, the way we are raised in the family, we are raised with two different parameters. So this distinction in parameters, this discrimination in parameters becomes so natural to us, we are conditioned that way. So this is how we look at women. As an adult, you are conditioned to look at women in a, in a particular perspective with a particular gender perspective. Different approach underlines this socialization process and treats these two as two different subcultures and languages culturally rooted. So if you find a difference, it is not because women are inferior. It is because both of them have been raised in a particular subculture. So it, it treats men and women as two different social categories and two, so who are socialized in two different cultures. This then results in varying communicative styles of men and women. Deborah Tanan is a major advocate of this position. Tanan undertook this concept further and popularized the difference approach with her work. You just don't understand women and men in conversation, published in 1990. And this approach develops two culture model for men and women, where children are socialized within two separate groups. And you can observe it all around you. She claimed six points for male and female language, and those six points are the first part of the phrase is for men, the second part is for women. And what uh, binary expression she gives? Support, status versus support. So the men are conscious of their status and position and they are conscious in their conversation about their status and position. Whereas women's language is more supportive, accommodative, and inclusive. So, a status versus support. The second phrase is independence versus intimacy. So, men are very particular about their, their rights, their position, their independence, whereas woman is inclusive, supportive, and wants to connect. Then the third is advice versus understanding. So the speech of men is more of instructive and didactic, whereas 
the woman expresses understanding and accommodating. Next is information versus feelings. Right? So men's speech is for disseminating information, facts, and very straightforward uh, information. That doesn't mean women are not as straightforward. But women express emotions, right? So feelings are attached. Ex you know, so experience, feelings are attached. So men's speech is informative or inf they prefer information. They extract only information, dry facts. Whereas women associate feeling in their, in their speech acts. Then orders versus proposals. Orders are exclusive. Proposals are inclusive. So men's speech, we can see orders, exclusion. In women's speech, we find proposals, kind of inclusion. And then conflicts versus compromise. Women show a higher degree of flexibility and accommodation, supporting behavior and inclusion as compared to men. So this is what difference approach. So this approach looks at men and women as two different categories, social categories, who are raised and conditioned in two different subcultures. But it does not treat men and women in an in asymmetrical way, uh, in a sim you know, hierarchical way. Right? It looks at them at equal level. The difference lies in the two subcultures and backgrounds in which they are conditioned and raised. And, uh, you know, uh, the study in language and gender continues and we witness an emergence of an independent field of study called gender study. And gender study draws heavily from multidisciplinary sources. It's not restricted to a particular discipline. So in social sciences, we see a new uh, emergence of a new field, which is very fertile and has attracted lots of attention of researchers in the field. And it draws heavily from anthropology, sociology, political science, literature, language, linguistics, and other, uh, you know, allied disciplines. We will continue our discussion on language and gender in our, uh, you know, a series of language and variation. When we talk about language and variation, we will continue with this discussion. And you can look into some major publications that I have mentioned here, if you want to understand, uh, you know, this concept and go deeper into it. And I hope that this gives you a broad understanding of relationship between language and gender where we can look at gender from two different perspectives one the language bias and and you know availability of structure and forms and uh, expressions in a particular language you know uh, directed towards women or other gender and uh, the way both the genders use language in their speech acts with these two perspectives, we can understand language and gender. There are three approaches available right now with us. Uh, deficit approach, which looks at women's language deficient. Uh, you know, dominance approach, which underlines the social roles, dominating social roles of men, and which is reflected in the language as well. And the third is difference approach, which treats men and women as two different social categories and it looks at the way they are raised into subcultures. It, it assigns equality, level of equality between these two genders. So this is it for now. We will continue our discussion. Thank you.